Welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you. And I don't know if you heard, but the Brain Warriors Way podcast uh, I did. was one of the top 20 all-time podcasts in mental health on Apple. So thank you, all of you. We just uh, went over 8 million downloads. Uh, and so we're grateful to all of the people who want to be brain warriors, uh, want to have better brains and better lives. Uh, and this week, we're going to talk about the cerebellum, which I actually call the Rodney Dangerfield part of the brain. And you know you're getting old when the young per people on your team have no idea who Rodney Dangerfield right. <laughs> is. Um, but Rodney Dangerfield was a comedian who used to always make jokes around, I get no respect. Right. And he didn't get any respect from his wife, his kids. Uh, actually, I can relate. Anyways. I'm um, sorry, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the cerebellum, back bottom part of your brain, has 10% of the brain's volume, but half of the brain's neurons. Mm. And it is so important that over the years, I've always been looking for ways to strengthen it. And we're gonna talk with our team member, Mary Schlesinger, who is our interactive metronome trainer at Amen Clinics in Weston. Although she does it for people around the world, um, she began using this technology, which we're going to talk about, with the goal of improving the lives of people who had cognitive and neurological challenges. Mary has a BA with a teaching certificate and an MBA um, and has been um, working with the Interactive Metronome actually for the last 15 years. So she is deeply experienced. We're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about post-pandemic sufferers and veterans. We're going to talk about who can benefit from it. Mary, welcome yes, to the Brain welcome. Warriors Way podcast. This is so interesting. I When I think of the metronome, I think of voice training. So this mm -hmm. is like fascinating to hear about it being used for the brain. And I know we do it at the clinics, but, but I don't know that a lot of people really have heard of metronome training for right and that's why i appreciate the opportunity to come and, and educate people um, i had never heard of it and the first time that i heard of it uh, there's a man i knew of who was using it actually for parkinson's and he had tremendous results and he happened to mention it to his adult daughter because she had several of her children were having challenges in school and they were really bright kids but you know things happen and so one by one, she started taking them through the program. And so I'm sort of seeing this in, in the lives of, of people I knew. But then I also found out that this was used in hospitals and it was used in rehab centers. And even military hospitals were using it for blast injury and, and some other things. So when I found that out, I thought, you know, this is a technology to take seriously if they're using it at, at this level. And that caught my attention. And then another thing that, that got me involved, I found out that when they were doing the research on this, they were doing um, functional MRIs on the individuals before they went to the pro through the program. And then when the program was over, they were taking MRIs again. And so they were able to see what parts of the brain were impacted. And I just, you know, to me, that just meant this is a really powerful technology. It's not just a matter of how do you feel? Do you feel a little you know, better in this area or that? So my intention and the, the thing that I thought was the most beautiful about this is being able to just take this out into the general public. I mean, why wait until you're in a hospital situation or you're in the rehab center <clears throat> to have access to this? <clears throat> um, so really anyone can use it. I mean, obviously people use it who are having particular struggles, but you don't have to even have a particular diagnosis or condition um, to benefit from it. And what they think happens, they theorize that it's actually resetting the timing in the brain. 
mm. at the millisecond level. And so we do know that rhythm and timing is a baseline brain function. And if you can straighten that out, then a lot of other brain functions start to fall into place. And so when I'm explaining this during an assessment, I tell people, you know, think of, um, think of when you're watching a movie, maybe you recorded something on your DVR and you turn it on and you can see the actor's lips moving, but you're not hearing it in sync. And, you know, you can watch it that way, but you, you know, it's going to kind of drive you crazy and it's going to be a little bit irritating and um, it's just going to interfere with your focus and so forth. So you rewind and fast forward and then it syncs up, right? So think of the brain that way. Or let's say you're going to go um, listen to an orchestra and most of the musicians are playing perfectly, but you have a group of musicians that are coming in way too fast and another group that that are um, coming in after the beat. And again, you might be able to identify the piece, but it's not the way that you want to hear it. It's not why you came to the concert. So, you know, I say think of the brain that way. But the nice thing about this technology is that anybody can use it. A baby, a student, a veteran, um, seniors. And, you know, it's just so broad in its application. And even, even the idea of working with babies, we didn't know you could do that at first. And there was a therapist that was working with a baby that had um, a genesis of the corpus callosum. And babe, basically this baby was a little rag doll laying in her crib. And, and the doctor said, you know, don't expect anything from, from this um, poor little baby. And so the therapist just wasn't getting anywhere with her, um, the tools that she had. So she asked the mom if she would be able to, uh, you know, have her permission to do some metronome on her. And she didn't know what to expect. So she put headphones on the baby and she put, strapped the hand sensor around her hand. And she started making the different movements just hand over hand. And obviously the baby had no idea, you know, what, what was taking place. But what happened that night was the baby giggled for the very first time. And then every time this therapist came, there was another change and another change and another change. And um, it was just pretty amazing. And so this little baby who they had told the family, you know, make the home wheelchair accessible. You know, she's never going to be able to walk or move. It got to the point where she was able to sit upright. She was making eye contact. She was um, starting to babble. She had sensory processing issues and that all settled down. She was starting to make crawling motions. You know, things were happening left and right. And they got her to the point where she could then step away from metronome and go do other technologies or other um, therapies to help her. And then, you know, they could circle back to metronome later. So that was huge because we thought you had to be able to follow simple instructions, maybe five, six, seven years old. And so this sort of broke open um, a whole nother group of, of people that we could help. And, and really, when you think of it, it's not just babies. There's, you know, at any great age, someone could have such a uh, disability that they really can't function and, and do so many therapies that are out there. But by doing it hand over hand, the brain doesn't know the difference. Um, and I use that with my, uh, some of the people I work with, and they're not in the situation of this little baby, but they're so off the beat that I can sort of fast track them, and, you know, help them along. So uh, I think that's just great that we can use it different ways. And then there's um, one other thing I wanted to say to introduce this. Some people want to have a non-medication approach. It's just, they just prefer that. Or in some cases they've had, you know, an addiction issue and they, they just, you know, they don't want to go down that road. Um, I work with a lot of people who have ADHD, a lot of kids, usually school age boys. And it seems to me that there's two camps of parent, <clears throat> the parents who say, there's no way you're going to medicate my five-year-old or my 10-year-old or anything like that. And, um, you know, they'll just walk out the door if you bring up that conversation. And then you have another group of parents who say, you know, we, we really don't have a problem with medication. It's just that the one that we were using, uh, you know, it's gone flat, it's not working, or the, the 
boy has uh, now has a flat affect, you know, whatever. So my goal is to use metronome to mitigate those symptoms to the point where they then have a choice to step away from the medication if they want to. And so, you know, that's the way that I approach it. That's how I, how I go through this training. Well, we all have, you know, at Amen Clinics, we have this mantra, first do no harm, use the least toxic, most effective treatment and the interactive metronome where you put a sensor in your hand for most people and mm-hmm. clap to the sound of a metronome. Many of our ADD. Oh, is that what, that's how it works? Yes. Many of our ADD or learning disabled um, kids and adults, um, they're really pretty terrible at it initially. And then with training over time, the better they get, the better the timing gets in the brain, their focus gets better, their mood gets better, their processing speed mm-hmm. gets better, and there are no side effects. People also use it to be better at sports, mm-hmm. for example. When we come back, Mary, let's talk about some of the cases you've worked with uh, mm-hmm. and the differences you've seen with the interactive metronome. Stay with okay. us. Welcome back. We are back with Mary Slussingers, who is one of our specialists in our Rustin clinic, and she does metronome therapy, which I'm just finding so fascinating to learn more about. Um, I think of metronome, as I said before, as something for voice training, but as someone who has worked with um, the brain a lot, um, besides being with you, um, I, it's making me remember when I did deep brain stimulation for Medtronic, and we would do, you know, the we'd place the the um, electrodes, I'm trying to explain it in very simple terms, um, for people with um, Parkinson's and they would stop their tremors. And the, what she's describing is nowhere near like, it's not invasive, but it's, re- it's sort of reminding me of how you reset or how you sort of, you know, get people to stop certain behaviors and focus better. So it's well, really and interesting. if you don't live near Reston, Barry actually does it virtually. Um, it's it, fascinating. And they're home trainers to better balance the brain. And what I like is it's non-invasive. Yeah. And so whatever you learn, post on any of your social media channels and take a picture and send it to us. You can also go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com and leave a comment, question, or review Mm -hmm. and we'll enter you into a raffle with one of Tana uh, Tana's cookbook or my new book, Mm -hmm. The End of Mental Mm -hmm. Illness. And the whole idea behind the end of mental illness is it begins with a revolution in brain health. Mm -hmm. And interactive metronome training is where it's part of that revolution in brain health to train the brain to work in a healthier way as opposed to just thinking about medicating the brain. Mm -hmm. So, welcome back, Mary. Do you have some cases you've worked with um, that you could just talk about? Why did they come to see you? Tell us more mm-hmm. about how the training works, how long the sessions are, how many times you do them, and okay. what have you seen? And the benefits. I want to hear about the benefits. Because you've been okay. excited about this for a long time. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very sold on this technology. Um, let me explain how it works first, and then I'll tell you about a couple in their 80s who came from metronome. And then if we have time um, during the hour, I'll also talk about a student who had uh, tremendous results. So first off, if you were to just walk down the hall and look in and watch me work with somebody, it doesn't really look like there's that much going on. I mean, they have headphones on and there's that uh, sensor strapped around one hand and the palm of the hand, maybe both hands. And they'll have a computer screen in front of them and they're tapping. But what's actually happening is that they're hearing not just a metronome, but a metronome that's measuring their performance to a thousandth of a second. And on that screen in front of them, um, 
what they're seeing is feedback that's telling them if they're a little bit off the beat and by how much. So it's not trying to trick them. It's just giving them very accurate feedback because it's 2,000th of a second. So a lot of the people I work with have focus and concentration issues. And so when they're with me, especially in the beginning, we're only going to do exercises that are uh, one minute or three minutes long because they can't hold it that long. And so with every single beat, they're getting that feedback and I'm standing or sitting next to them and they're trying to track with the beat. Well, the minute, the millisecond that they start to think of something else, what they did that morning, what they're going to do later, it tells on them because their, their timing is off just that fraction. And so I can see how well they're staying on the beat and they can see it because everything is scored. So there's ways that they're signaled to make some corrections. So over time, we take these short exercises within the hour and we lengthen them so that they're holding that concentration longer and longer and longer. So that's one aspect of it. But another aspect of it is that with every tap and they see the screen light, the brain has to take in the information and plan, sequence, and execute that muscle movement. So there's a whole visual processing thing that's going on here. <clears throat> and you have to remember, you know, people are doing this and by the time they're done, it might be 21 or 23,000 reps. So you've really worked on these different areas that I'm going to mention. So they are taking this information in and, and I mean, making their adjustments, but there's something else that's going on. The tempo, we can change all of these elements, but the tempo is set at 54 beats a minute. So it's basically clank, clank, clank. It's not that fast. And I believe that they purposely kept the tempo slow like that. Because if most of us tend, I think, my opinion, is to be a little to the impulsive side. And <clears throat> what happens by having the tempo slower is with every single beat, you have to hold back a little bit. So you do that holding back 20 something thousand times, you've changed that part of your brain that has to do with impulsivity and the ability to self-regulate. So let me give you an example. If I put a hand sensor on, on your hands and headphones and I turned the tempo up so it was faster, you would actually get probably get a better score mm -hmm. than by having it slower because it requires more out of you to really have to hold back and to try and be on the beat at a slower tempo. So all those ADHD kids or the people with PTSD that are finding themselves impulsive or autism, whatever, um, that's helping. And then on top of that, what's happening is that there's an auditory component. So once they get comfortable, you know, maybe the, after the first session, I start to bring in some background noises. And initially, I just tell them, you know, this is just to make you work a little harder. You're, you have to stay more focused. But actually what's happening, and they don't even need to know this, is that those background noises sync up with what's on the screen. So if the left side of the screen lights up to tell them to slow down, they hear a tone in the left headphone. And if the right side lights up to tell them to go faster, they hear that in the right headphone. And if they're really close, really on the beat, they hear a pleasant sound. And then there's sort of a neutral sound. And if they're way off the beat, they hear it's more kind of like a bonk kind of sound. So the visual and the auditory are syncing up. So, you know, you put all this together with all of these repetitions and you're creating these neural connections and you're getting them to the point where they're hardwired and their research shows that you go a year out and, and those gains are typically still there unless they have something um, like Parkinson's or something degenerative where they, they need to tweak a little bit every so often. So, you know, it all kind of comes down to doing some, doing movement with something cognitive. And in, in this case, movement with, with audio, with visual. And when you put it all together, um, and maybe Dr. Amon can explain this, I'm, then it kind of goes where it's not into my area of expertise, but there's some type of a synergistic effect by putting all of these things together. And so, you know, that's what's going on um, 
when you're. So we actually see their cerebellum activate. This just incredibly beautiful, important part of the brain, which on spec for a lot of our patients is sleepy. It's just not working as hard as it should, especially in ADD, especially in autism or a traumatic brain injury. So it's a tool to really rehabilitate uh, their brain. Um, we only have two minutes left. Tell us about the 80-year-old couple. Okay. Well, um, they're, they're obviously an 80-year-old couple, and they uh, were perfectly active. And then one day she had a stroke. So she completed her rehab, and they told her, you know, there was nothing else to be done. This was as far as it was going to go. Uh, she started coming for metronome. Uh, she had balance issues. The left side wasn't working so well. She was using a walker. And she could walk without it, but she had to be near furniture or near a wall so that she wouldn't fall and, and have something happen. So I timed her going up and down the stairs every time she came. And when she first started, it was taking her 48 seconds to go down one flight of stairs in a home. By the time she was done, it took her 24 seconds. Wow. So we cut that time in half. And obviously, when things like stroke happen, you, know, you want to get it back to as close as you can back to what was your normal. So that was her really nice outcome. Now with Tom, her husband, he was basically just driving her over. But once we got started, he said, well, gee, you know, I think I could use this too. And so he started going through the training. And the thing that I noticed about Tom, when we first, uh, I, I knew them from before, but when we first got together, when we were talking, it was just a normal, how are you, how's the weather, and, and so forth. But by the time he was done with the program, his, I don't even know how to describe it. He was much more involved in the conversation, asking questions, giving more in-depth answers, uh, bringing up other pieces of information. And the only way I can describe it, because um, like I said, I didn't notice anything being problematic before, but I felt like Tom was more present. There was more of him in the room once he had finished that program. And um, it didn't take that long to do it. It was um, you know, relatively quick. But so that was, you know, just. Uh, How many sessions on average for these two people? Um, so I, one person with a stroke, the other person just wanted to be better. Right, right. It kind of goes person to person. But if I remember correctly, Fritzy, the one, the one that had the stroke, came either 17 or 18 times, something like that. So it wasn't too long. And then Tom came, I think it was about 15 times. because He started a little bit after her. <clears throat> and we just did them back to back, not at the same time. But when it comes to, say, ADHD, I used to try and fit everybody into 14 or 15 sessions, but I learn that that's not everybody. So, you know, I usually say somewhere between 14 and 17 sessions, maybe 18. Those with autism, a little bit more. Um, you know, if they have something really, really serious, then we might go into the, you know, 20s. But it's not something that you're doing for a long time. You try to get to the bulk of your gains, and then you're at a safe place to stop. But some people don't want to stop. They want to keep going for more gains. And so we, we do it that, that way as well. Excellent. I That's love so that. Cool. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk about more practical examples of how the interactive metronome and enhancing the cerebellum overall. We're getting ready to do a new project with the USATT. It's the United States of America Table Tennis mm -hmm. Organization. Um, optimize the cerebellum, change the cerebellum, change your life. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're here with Mary Schlesinger, our inter 
um, interactive metronome therapist um, who is based in our Reston, Virginia clinic. But now with the pandemic, what we've realized is we have to do so many things virtual. And this is such an interesting, important therapy to optimize one of the most under um, recognized parts of the brain, the cerebellum. Now, before we get too far along, um, we would love for you to post something that you learned today. I'm actually learning a ton. Um, if I'm being overly quiet, that more quiet than I usually am, it's because I this is this is pretty new to me, and I'm finding it pretty fascinating. So, if you are learning something, or you know someone maybe who's been through this or who could use it, post it. Also, send us your questions and your comments. And if you would be so kind as to leave us a review at brainwarriorswaypodcast.com, we would be ever so grateful. Um, and Mary, I'm curious, what, how on earth did you get interested in this? Well, like I was saying earlier, you know, it was just, it just all started with uh, a man I knew of who was doing it for Parkinson's and my father had Parkinson's. And so I thought, well, okay, you know, let's, let's see what this is about. And so then as I would say, my friend with her children and it kind of went from there, it just kind of you know, started, I have a background, um, I would say certification in, in teaching. I didn't go that direction once I got out of college and I did do teaching later, but I think there's always been a teacher in me. And for me, this is the best kind of teaching there is because it's one-on-one -on -one and you really get to know the individual because they're, you know, entrusting very personal parts of their life with you. And you get to see them get to the point where, they have the improvements that they need. And basically the, the confidence goes through the roof. I mean, some people, when they come by uh, to the begin, you know, their, their head is hanging low and they feel bad about themselves and they feel like this is going to be another therapy that they're going to fail at, but they leave so confident. And so it's just, you know, every person is, it's like reading a different book. You know, they each have a different story, but they all have a nice ending and it's just, um, so fun to see that transition and to just see the trajectory of their life um, change. Well, and one of the things this reminds me of, so we talked about table tennis a little bit. Um, it's that repetitive movement that is working the cerebellum. And during the pandemic, I taught my 10 year old niece how to play ping pong. And initially she hated it and she was no good at it, but the training I could see every day she was better than the day before and then developing competence. Um, it is just really fun to see her blossom, yeah. but I'm also thinking about karate Yeah, because one of the reasons, so karate is bad if you get hit in the head, right? Brain is soft, skull is hard, don't get a head injury. But the complex mm -hmm. motor movements that you do repetitively, mm -hmm. the katas, that you learn is so good well, and for your soothing. cerebellum. It's also soothing. I was thinking about this as you were going. It's one of the reasons I asked that question about how you got involved in this. Um, I was wondering if you had done any research on this because I was thinking about it as you go. I do this weird tapping thing in my car if I'm stressed out. I'm, I know I'm, people are going to go, okay, she's really weird. But I don't know if I'm the only person who does this. But on my, on my steering wheel, I'll do this bilateral sort of like tapping thing. And it, it soothes me if I'm really anxious, I'm late for something, I'm... I've got a lot on my mind. There's all sort of tap to music and it like, it settles mm -hmm. me down just like karate yeah. settles me down. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if it has that same sort of effect. Yes, it, it definitely does. Um, in fact, I tell people it, it just ties in with what you're saying. I say, you know, if you're stressed and you're, you go out taking a walk um, and I just kind of found this out myself by accident. Usually I take a walk and I kind of, you know, de-stress, but I found out that I wasn't. And so I started making the right hand. It's basically a tap where you're making a circle mm -hmm. on your leg as you're tapping. And I just started doing that and it helped me relax. But I mm -hmm. do know that when I work with individuals, um, I didn't really go over all of the things that typically change, but usually besides focus and concentration and impulsivity, I tend to see initiative and organization, but I see also reduction in anxiety. And I see um, uh, motor changes too. So this is used for neurological as well. So I see uh, reduction in ticks and things like that. But I've had people tell me that 
they fall asleep faster or they stay asleep. Uh, things just settle down in their in their mind and in their body. So <clears throat> I think that's really important. I've worked with people who uh, you know pick at their fingers so much that they have to bandage them because they're bleeding. And there's just you know it's not just the adults, the kids. There's a lot of kids that just carry a tremendous amount of stress, and it just de-stresses them and. Um, and just, just like it does with the impulsivity, I have kids, or, well, mostly kids, sometimes adults, who come in and they are um, really up on the ceiling. You know, they're really there. And by the time they leave, they leave different. Now, it's not hardwired yet, but just by doing it for an hour, um, they're much more settled and that stays there. Yeah, that made me think what you brought up. I was just thinking the same thing because um, there are lots of studies. I believe there's 127 studies on martial arts and how it is good for um, certain issues. I hate calling them disorders, but issues um, like autism, um, ADD, behavioral issues because of that settling. It's the katas that are so good for them. It's because of the rhythmic movement. And But there are a lot of people who can't do martial arts. And so that, that's what's making me think about this. It's the rhythmic motion of it. It's that. So I'm wondering that's got to have that. Maybe it has that same effect. And, and if somebody's listening and they want to do this therapy with you or talk to you about uh-huh. that, how, mm-hmm. how do they do that? They just call the call center. Um, sure. at their clinics. Um, mm-hmm. There is information on interactive metronome on our website, but uh, t- tell us another story, uh, okay. Uh, okay. perhaps a student you've worked with. Okay. Okay. And yes, they would just call um, Metro. I mean, they would call AIM Clinic. And like you said, there is a good piece on the website, the AIM Clinic website that actually shows a video clip of it being done and what have you, but I would definitely call them back. The starting point is the assessment, and that's where they come in, get some basic scores, and gives them a good introduction to metronome. They, they have the headphones on and the sensor, and they can kind of get an idea what it feels like. And, and I even let the other family members try it out, too. But in terms of another story, this one was really important to me. This was a girl, uh, she was a rising sixth grader. And she had ADHD and um, she was making good grades, but it was sheer determination and she was on medication. Um, She was on adult levels of Concerta. She was taking Intuniv. Um, She barely got through the school day. And then by the time she got home, she had to take more to get through the homework. And then every night she ended up taking melatonin so then she could fall asleep and start it all over again. And she got to the point where it was a a failure to thrive situation. Uh, The Concerta had, you know, taken away her, her appetite. So her stomach would be growling, but, but she just was not eating her lunch. And so the mom was really, really getting worried. And the doctor said, look, you know, there's nothing else I can give her. I mean, she's already on adult levels and she was a, a very wispy young girl. And so it was summertime. And the mother said, you know, I'm just taking her off of everything. It's summer. It doesn't matter if she's bouncy. So she took her off and she called me. She didn't know anything about metronome. She'd just come across it and and then did a little research and called me. So I started working with her and it was over a 49 day period in the summer, but we really only worked believe it was maybe 17 sessions. So 17 one hour sessions. You, you don't do it for more than an hour at a time. Uh, because even if you're not tired, the brain's been given a workout. So it needs to rest overnight. You can do it the next day. So, okay. So it's time for school to start. And also she was very carrying a lot of stress about transitioning into middle school and kind of stuck in that loop. So, We went through the sessions and she started and it was at obviously at a new school and the mom wasn't getting any calls from the teachers. And so she called the school and she said, did you all lose my phone number? Because, you know, it's a new school, but she was so used to getting the calls and um, because she went back with no medication. So they said, no, no, we just didn't have any reason to call you. Now, 
this girl was on an individualized education plan where they give you a little extra time or make some accommodations. And so what happened was uh, when the mom talked to the teachers, they said, no, you know, she's a little bit chatty, but it's just whatever you would expect from a sixth grade girl. And so what was interesting was they had their first IEP meeting and the teachers all came and they said, you know what? We don't really know why she's on an IEP. She doesn't need to be on an IEP. So it was just amazing to go from adult levels of medications to starting a new school year in an unfamiliar school um, and having what would be extra layer of stress and not having your medication and yet still being able to maintain your grades and um, actually be released from the IEP. That's so yeah. I know it was so exciting. It was really, really great. And the mother, um, I, what I do is I have people give me examples of why they came really specific. You know, this tends to happen and this is the scenario and this is how often. And then I have them make goals because you forget where your starting point was when you start to improve and it's in their own handwriting. So I love going back to those and saying, remember how you had this problem? And they're like, oh yeah, I kind of forgot about that. That wasn't, hasn't been bothering me lately. And so um, this mother uh, on her own, she was documenting everything. And she wrote me, I think it was probably a three page, maybe four page, um, single spaced. Uh, wow, I want sequence. you to send that everything. to me. We're running out of time, uh, okay. but you know, I mean, that's what keeps you excited uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. about what you do. When you change someone's cerebellum, you change their life. So stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about more stories about how the interactive metronome might help you um, post one thing you learned um, on any of your social media sites. We're so excited. The Brain Warriors Way podcast listed is one of the all-time best podcasts on uh, Apple Podcasts. And if you leave us a comment, question, or review at brainwarriorswaypodcast.com, we'll enter you into a raffle to win either the Brain Warriors Way cookbook or the end of mental illness. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are here in our fourth episode with Mary Schlesinger. She is an interactive metronome um, therapist, and she's in our Ruston Clinic. And this has just been so interesting hearing about this non-invasive treatment. Um, I'm just I'm making so many comparisons in my mind. So welcome back, Mary. Um, this has been so interesting hearing the stories about kids being able to make these types of improvements. I always talked about a baby. We've talked right. about kids with ADD and autism. We've talked about an elderly couple. Your brain, no matter what your age, is critically important. Right. And one of the most important parts of the brain that very few people talk about, besides us at Amon Clinics, is the cerebellum. Yeah. And how I learned it was important is on spec scans, the cerebellum is the most active part of the brain. It's not true with PAD. It's clearly not true with quantitative EEG. But um, the medicine we use with SPECT goes to the cerebellum, and it is usually the most active part of the brain, which makes complete sense because it's 10% of the brain's volume, but it has half the brain's neurons. And I think of it as the CPU or the central processing unit in the brain. And when the cerebellum's hurt, everything is not good. Um, and this is why actually you shouldn't drink because drinking shrinks the cerebellum. Um, so Mary, I want you and I to do a study of like 20 consecutive people you work with and we should actually do before and after scans. I know there's a lot of research published on mm -hmm. the cerebellum and the interactive metronome. Uh, mm -hmm. but we should do our own. Um, but just go through the list of people you've seen, um, what kind of problems they had 
and how this has helped them. And, and the other beautiful part about this is there's virtually no side effects. It's just, mm -hmm. it's an investment in time um, mm -hmm. and a little bit of money. It's actually not very expensive, but mm -hmm. time, um, a little bit of money and the potential benefits for people. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I Gosh, where do, we, where do you even start? I've worked with people who have autism on the autism spectrum. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty tough situation. But there again, calming things down, getting them to the point where they're able to um, be more directed in the classroom. Um, you get comments coming back from the teachers, things like that. Um, and just to be more stable, more steady, that sort of thing. Uh, I have worked with people who have PTSD. I had the opportunity to work somebody with someone who was um, um, kind of caught in a domestic terrorism situation, uh, one of the big ones. And he had uh, basically anger management issues and just foggy thinking. He had problems learning and just everything that went with that. It was impacting his personal life and his work life. And he went through the program, really, really nice results. He was able to identify when he was getting angry and then de-escalate. And he was able to understand how other people could maybe not want to be around him. He could see where his actions were impacting other people. So all of that smoothed out. He regained his confidence and, um, you know, improved his memory and just uh, not feeling apathetic anymore. So... That was a good one. Obviously, you know, I talked about ADHD, but so many kids that have ADHD. Uh, <clears throat> I've had people who, like I had one man, his son, basically, uh, he was around six years old and they'd never been able to reach him. And when they did metronome and they had a very, very quick result, he said, thank you. You have just, for the first time, introduced us to our son. Hmm. And it just sent chills through my body. It, and it, it turns out to be, you know, just this wonderful little boy and a great kid. And you know, he still has some things that he's working on. But, you know, I hear things like that. And then with older people, sometimes they um, just want to stay sharp. I have been giving presentations to retirees. And, you know, there's three things in my mind that are important. You want to be able to stay behind the wheel as long as you can do so safely. So this has an impact in that area. Obviously you don't want to be a fall risk because we all know what happens. Uh, my poor father broke his shoulder, elbow and hip all in one fall. And so nobody wants to go down that road. And then you just obviously want to stay brain sharp. So those are the things that I emphasize when I give the presentations to the, um, the 55 plus positive aging type presentations because those are the things that I want to avoid. And so, and then there's a lot of seniors who are, you know, out gardening and things. And so they're bending down and they're standing on slippery flagstone and, and things like that. And so they want to have a good sense of balance and coordination. So there's that. Um, gosh, uh, people with traumatic brain injury, Lyme, you know, just on and on. It, it can be really well, any cause. Let's, let's talk about traumatic brain injury for a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a very clear dynamic tension between the front part of the brain and the cerebellum. And mm -hmm. so if you think of the front part of the brain, um, fo focus, forethought, judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, learning from the mistakes you make. And when you hurt the left or right side, it actually turns off the opposite mm -hmm. side cerebellum. Mm -hmm. Actually, a long term for it, it's called crossed because it crosses cerebellar diaschesis. Diaschesis just meaning low activity, low blood flow. Mm -hmm. And we find activating the cerebellum actually helps the front part of the brain work better. So if you damage the left or right front part of your brain, in a fall, in a car accident, in a domestic violence situation. Um, part of rehabilitating that is also rehabilitating the cerebellum. 
And this is where the interactive metronome can be really helpful mm -hmm. for someone. So just think of it as rebalancing your brain. When the cerebellum is low, people tend to have coordination problems, but also thought coordination mm -hmm. problems, uh, how quickly you can integrate new information. And so processing speed um, mm -hmm. likely goes up as well. Yeah, that's super interesting. Right. Well, they did some research on that, and I actually have the title of the research. It was um, This was a journal of neuropsychology. And the title is Effective Interactive Metronome Therapy on Cognitive Function After Blast-Related Brain mm -hmm. Injury. Dr. Lonnie Nelson and um, Drs. McDonald, Stahl, and Paston. And they took 50 combat vets. And um, these were all veterans that were two and a half years post-injury. And they took them through metronome and some traditional training. And the other group was just the traditional training. And they found that in 21 of 26 areas, they had significant improvement. And um, some of the areas included uh, processing speed, I think you mentioned, attention and memory and things like that. So that was a very nice uh, piece of research. And in my mind, if you have a traumatic brain injury, a blast injury, because you're a combat vet, it's not unlikely that you wouldn't have a PTSD situation as well. So that's just a nice piece of research that um, I think would be important for veterans to take a look at. That'd be great. Yeah, well, we have to stop, but we're so grateful for the work you do at our Reston Clinic, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. And what, what did you learn during the series of podcasts with Mary? Um, what's the one thing? Um, post that on any of your social media channels and then um, leave it at the Brain Warriors Way podcast.com. Also leave us a comment question or a review and we'll enter you into a drawing to um, get Tana's book, The Brain Warrior's Way Cookbook, or my new book, The End of Mental Illness. Mary, we're just awesome. so grateful for Thanks, your work Mary. and your time. If you're enjoying The Brain Warrior's Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855 978-1363.